few logistical issues. Uh, we now have help session times and rooms. They're up on the screen. They will start meeting next Wednesday and Thursday, right? So the plan is Wednesday and Thursday's help sessions are for homework one. So they're the week before homework one is due. Then the following week, the Monday and Tuesday before exam one, well, the help sessions will be for exam one. So most of the locations, actually this year we got a lot in this room, it only holds 40 people. I don't know how many people will show up. If this is catastrophe, we'll have to get a different room at some point. But, uh, and just because you can't make one of these times doesn't mean you, know, you can't get help, right? We have office hours, you can make special arrangements with us. So keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> I've added something on models. So I think often one of the confusing things about models is that you already understand all the concepts. You're just not used to our pigeonholing or semantics. So I've taken a kind of everyday situation, we might call it. And put it at the end of chapter five. So down here, the way this works, I guess, is you click on each page in the chapter and it comes up. But this here, what I call how you describe things, takes um, the language we've been using in class, the concepts, and applies it to the everyday situation of you start out with a, you know, you got a runny nose or you think you might have a cold or allergies. Um, you want to do something about this. You're going to go to the store to get an antihistamine. Uh, you know, which package do you buy, et cetera. And so that's the, what I call your language and concepts, really all of our language and concepts. And I take each step of this and turn it into how we describe it in terms of the models, how the model may be useful, and what the limitations are. I don't know whether that'll be useful to you or not, but it's kind of, you know, every, but I'm, the point I'm trying to get across is that everything we do about decisions we make and that, intrinsically involves, involves this process, and so this is one way of showing it. And by the way, that link is also on our other um, home page. So most things that I put up are available both on this page and the UT page. On the UT page, this looks a bit like um, models in everyday life. <clears throat> right, so homework one is due in 10 days, and then exam one is in about 12 days. What I want to do, I'm going to do a number of things today, but we're going to wrap up the condom testing lecture. And so it's at this point, the demonstrations are over, sadly. Um, but I want to kind of put things in perspective and and let you kind of fill out some, some tables. So let's note up here, help sessions next Wednesday and Thursday. And now finish condom testing. Note that we're using uh, models of condom testing, or models in condom testing, as models of sex, right? So however artificial they may seem, given what our goal is, that is kind of what we're using them as. And so much, some of this was filled out last time, but uh, we'll complete the table. So I'm going to list three models, and then we want to know whether we consider them to be accurate, convenient, and uniform. So we had the trained text.
volunteers and mechanical tests. So you can put in, I want you to try and fill it out. And actually, I think two thirds of this table it was in your notes, but I didn't, I didn't cover all of it. <clears throat> So just put in pluses, minus, question marks, plus, slash, minus, et cetera, where you think they belong. So which tests do we, or models, do we consider to be the accurate ones? <laughs> Anything involving people, mechanical tests, accurate? Obvious, well, however stunted your sex education may have been in this state, um, presumably we can all get that one right. In terms of, um, so uniformity, what we're going to put in this column? Volunteers uniform? How about mechanical tests? Absolutely. That's their big advantage from an industrial point of view. Someone can say, you got to make a condom that will hold 17 liters of air. That, by the way, is the standard. Industry can do that. As long as you say, pass this test, and it's a it's a uniform test. We can apply it over, you know, time and time again. Industry can figure out how to solve it. Trained techs, we would say, are uniform, at least relative to volunteers, but they're probably not as uniform as mechanical tests. Convenience-wise, we already said that. Very inconvenient to use trained people because we're talking about doing experiments with people at that case. Here, I don't know what to put. It's kind of a mix of the two. Are mechanical tests convenient? Absolutely. <clears throat> now I want to comment that um, that the these properties of the model apply regardless of the goal, right? As long as we say we're using, you know, these are models of sex. Um, doesn't matter what the goal is, we can assign whether they're accurate, convenient, and uniform. But the moment we talk about limitations, those do depend on the goal. So that's a, a summary from last time. We're going to have another table further down the road, but I want to talk next about volunteer studies. Goal? <clears throat> and here we're concerned with Assessing STD transmission. And this actually was HIV. So, you know, the history was HIV was, um, they realized they had this disease about the time I got to UT, maybe a little before early 80s. And unprecedented in many ways, they, initially they didn't know what was going on. They knew they had some people dying in San Francisco. Their immune systems were collapsing, you know, and eventually they figured out it was um, a sexually transmitted disease. Unprecedented in many respects. But 
you know, a massive worldwide epidemic, right? We're talking about tens of millions of people infected, and at the time, uh, it was a death sentence because we didn't have drugs available. So there was a lot of interest in figuring out how to prevent transmission of that, you know, and people aren't going to quit having sex, so the question was, well, if they had sex with condoms, would that reduce transmission? So there were some volunteer studies done, and there may have been some done um, more recently, and the question is, if you're going to do a study like this to figure out, so we're asking the question, do condoms prevent or reduce the transmission of HIV? How are you going to go about doing this with volunteers? Let's say you're going to work with couples. What are the character and, and you got couples willing to volunteer. What kind of couples are going to be useful? Well, ones where one's infected and the other one isn't. So you hear that? One of them has to be infected and the other not. Now, if they're both uninfected and they're having sex with partners outside the relationship, you might be able to use them. But if they're both already infected, they're useless for you in figuring out transmission right, because they're already infected. So what you're really doing is a study here of, you know, it's called, by the way, discordant couples, which I don't ask definitions in this class. Um, one is HIV plus, one is HIV minus, and so you're really looking at the rate at which HIV minus becomes HIV plus. Right, that's the only thing that, that can be useful in this type of study. Now, now that we know more about this, um, there might be other methods you could use to look at transmission, but that is the kind of acid test of transmission. <clears throat> now, how do you think you can go about doing condom studies? Okay, let's say you have 100 couples discordant couples that are volunteering in your study that they will be subject, they agree to be monitored. What's the next thing? What do you, how do you go about testing whether condoms block HIV transmission or not? This, now we're considering the reality of this study, ethics and everything, what can you do? So, did you want to volunteer something too? Well, wouldn't it be a little bit unethical if you actually volunteered for the condom and you didn't know that they're agnostic as to the condom? Because some of the couples, and I'm pretty sure that it's not like that's worth a little bit of that. Whether it's actually treatment, you know, you're watching. So, you're saying it's unethical to so, so yes, you're correct. You cannot, and that was her point too, um, you cannot, if you think that condoms actually block transmission, then it is unethical and it would not be approved for enlisting people in a study where you discourage condom use. Now, I don't know whether you could not even raise the subject about it, um, say, well, we'd like to monitor you over time, but in any case, you can't assign some couples to no condom use and others to condom use. That is unethical. You could try and assign them all to condom use, et cetera. So you're, that is, quote, in essence, it's a scientific limitation of the study, but it's um, you know, one that we happily accept. So all you can do at this point is um, observe the couple over time And at some point, ask about condom use. And you don't know whether they're telling you the truth. And you're not going to have categories of, you know, it's the world isn't going to be divided into couples that always use condoms and couples that never use condoms. Right? There's going to be a mix. 
And so you asked him about condom use. It's, gotta, it's probably going to be after the fact, at least either at the end of the study or when you know that the HIV uh, negative person has converted. And you sort of get a general sense of, well, yeah, we sometimes, but not very often, things like that. <clears throat> so you go through all of this. You, you, know, you're, you can't control the behaviors. Uh, you don't want to control the behaviors. And you can't necessarily know what the behaviors were. And you get to the end, and basically all you can do is assign <clears throat> couples to consistent and inconsistent groups. And I suppose you could do a third category, say, well, somewhere in the middle. But it's been done this way. <clears throat> so you have two groups, and then you look at the conversion rate. And hopefully, when you do the study, for reasons we'll talk about it weeks from now, um, you don't make the assignment to whether they're consistent or inconsistent users after knowing whether they converted or not, right? This should be done in a, what's called a blind fashion, so that, you know, because otherwise there'd be a temptation to say, well, I don't know quite how to assign them, but since the person converted, they probably didn't use condoms very often, I'll assign them to the inconsistent group. That would not be the way to do the study, yeah? Sorry, if one what? Um, so in fact, well, certainly one act can, but the, the actual probability per sex act is less than 1%. I think it might be one in 1,000 or something like that. It's not very high, but you're right. If there was a 100% chance of transmission, um, you didn't use a condom, then the, you'd have gotten nothing here. So, so what this actually, and we didn't know this at the time, right? We didn't know what the odds of transmission were. We kind of figured it out after the fact. And there are all kinds of things in the biology of HIV that I could go into to talk about the basis of transmission. You know, when you, you they're different, man, eh, never mind, that's biology. So um, anyway, so you're, so all these imperfections, you get to the end and you have data that are conversion rates and group, and you have consistent and you have inconsistent. And by the way, you have maybe 100 couples, maybe a little more than that. But again, you got to find volunteers. They got to have discordant couples all that, and then they got to show up at the end. All, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong with this, but you get to the end, and what's been found in a couple of different studies is the conversion rate for consistent condom users is zero to two percent. This is over a long period of time of, I don't know, a half a year, a year, or something like that. For inconsistent users, it's 10 to 12 <clears> percent. <throat> so it's not 100% under any circumstances, um, but it does look as though here there is an effect, beneficial effect of condom use in blocking HIV transmission. <clears throat> now, to reinforce some of this and actually remind, well, help you think about what I just said. Let's do one, one poll in class. <clears throat> so what are limitations of volunteer studies in evaluating a condom batch for the goal of avoiding STD transmission? So now we're asking a little bit different question. Suppose we're going back to the mechanical tests, uh, the idea of trained sex technicians, and, and so on. Suppose we were to use volunteers to evaluate batches of condoms for whether they, you know, should, whether they pass muster. So you got three choices. From bottom to top, it is difficult to get large samples of volunteers. 
There is a slow turnaround time from, sorry, there's slow turnaround from the time a batch of condoms is made until you find out if they're effective. And the top one, the source of any STD transmission that you observe cannot be attributed to the condom being bad when you're using volunteer studies. So pick, ah, crap, I didn't want this. Ah. How many would say they're confused on this one? Why? Okay, so you think more than one answer is correct. How many agree with that? Oh, interesting. So, how many think that they're all correct? So, they are, they are all correct. Um, I just did this because one, I wanted to sort of confuse you enough to come to that realization on your own. And also, I was curious as to which one you'd go for if they were all correct. First class went mostly for the first one, but you guys are about equally split between the first and the last. Anyway, they're all correct. So, so I guess I can review them, too. The problem with volunteer studies is you don't know, if you get transmissions with condoms, you don't know who's at fault. One, because they're not uniform. Um, second, there is a slow turnaround time from when a batch of condoms is made until you find out if they're effective. So if you were in industry trying to do this, you'd make this, you'd have to distribute them out to volunteers, you'd have to wait, you know, especially if you're waiting for tr disease transmissions, you'd have to wait months to figure out how good they were, and you can't get large samples. So all of those are um, limitations of volunteer studies in using um, and, and evaluating a batch of condoms. <clears throat> so the volunteers have several limitations. as a model to evaluate a batch of condoms, or in fact, evaluate condoms in any fashion. Okay, so what I've just written here is what we just did with that poll. So the last thing I want to do for this topic of condom testing is a big table, and I'm going to let you fill in most of it. So there are going to be four columns and five rows. It's going to be model goal, um, <clears throat> how the model's useful and what the limitations are. And the model, the first two models will be the airburst test. Third will be applied to both the airburst test and the water leak test. Four will be the water leak test, and five will be volunteers. The goal will be no STD passage. Uh, 
for number one, no pores. The second, goal of thin and flexible for three. No pores for the water leak test. And finally, for the volunteers, no STD transmission. And what I want you to do is fill out the rest of the table. So take, I don't know, three minutes or so to do it. Airburst test? Yes, we've changed the goal. So if you have different goals, then the content of the table is going to change. That's partly why I'm setting it up this way. So, under the how useful column, where are we going to put not? <clears throat> I got to vote for the first two. So, <clears throat> so I'm going to put for the first one not um, up there in parens because I'll comment on that. How about these tests for thin and flexible? What? But, but in essence, <laughs> you can't assess anything about how thin and flexible they are. So you'd put a knot there. Um, so, and by the way, I'll, I'll fill this out to some extent, but it's not that you have to get my wording, right? You just have to have an idea of, you have to have the right idea. You could have argued for the airburst test and no STD passage, maybe that word passage is misleading, um, that, well, the test could be useful and that it may indicate weak points in a condom that would allow STD passage. I mean, you could, you could argue it either way, right? I mean, it's certainly not very useful, but there might be some um, way you can stretch to this point. But if you do say it's useful in that respect, um, <clears throat> it does not really address STD passage except when the condom breaks. <coughs> right, so 
you're not, you know, you can't tell whether they're going in back and forth across the latex, but if the condom breaks, you know that the barrier is gone. Um, <clears throat> I better draw that here. Uh, not at all, Eber's test doesn't tell you anything about pores. You could have all kinds of pores in there and it, it would perform just fine. So you just say it does not assess here, which is obvious, does not assess there. So now we get down to the water leak test uh, with the goal of not having any pores. Is, is that at all useful for that? Okay, so it really depends on your definition of pores. It would pick up things that are way too small to see with your eye. So how it, you know, if that was your concern, it picks up large pores, but does not pick up small ones. <clears throat> And I don't know what, when they instituted that test, whether they knew this, uh, and maybe they actually um, reject some based on the test. I just I have no idea. <clears throat> so the volunteer studies are useful in that you can actually identify, or I can say identify actual STD transmission. You can pick up some real transmissions with it. But you got all the limitations um, as per the poll done in class. So none of this is perfect. None of these models, none of these tests cover what we want com covered. They're kind of, it's like a patchwork quilt with a whole bunch of holes in it, but we kind of thread the whole thing together and figure, okay, well, we're as close as we can get. But we got all these overlapping models to help us accomplish that. So that's end of condom testing. What I want to do now is go over homework one, right? I want to introduce you to what you're going to do. Uh, there are instructions up there, but they might not be obvious. So first of all, let's look at some instructions. <clears throat> so I guess this is our web page. Here's homework. We click on that. So homework one instructions. You go to this. Um, I need to update this. The homework is actually worth 40 points this year. At the past, it's always been worth 33, but I upped it. Um, you're going to locate a news article or some kind of article. It can be online. It can be paper copy. Less than nine months old. Why do you think I want it less than nine months old? Relevant. Relevant. That's one possibility. So the what are... So the methods are up to date. Let's get practical here. I don't want last year's assignments showing up. So if you have to use an article that's less than nine months old, people in the class last year couldn't have used that article. <clears throat> so that's what it comes down to, right? Um, and so if it's 10 months, you won't get dinged on it. But, but if it's close enough that we can think, ooh, you know, maybe, that, maybe we saw that last year. <laughs> Not good. Um, what you're going to do is identify two models of different types in this article. If you can't identify two models of different types in the same article, you can use a second article. You shouldn't have to go there, but we're trying not to constrain you in any way. <clears throat> um, and then you're going to fill out a template, right? It's kind of like the table you were just filling out here. Um, <clears throat> and you're going to we're going to use a particular form that says articles here. You, um, nine months old again. And you're going to take this form. You're going to get a PDF out of this. You're going to take this form and you're going to upload it to Blackboard. And you're going to upload it to, yeah, I didn't update this one. So somewhere I just updated this thing. But anyway, 
You're going to upload it to a virtual class, which is V00197, I think, not the unique number for the section you're in. So there's a virtual class that combines both the 10 and o'clock, 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock. That's the one you're going to upload it to. If you try and upload it to the other one, you won't see any kind of link or whatever it is on there to do it. So you're going to upload it to that, and then you're done. Um, if you can't, if there's not a link to your article that we can go to, then we kind of need some indication of what the article was. So you can scan it. You can, I don't know, figure out some way. You could bring a hard copy into to class if you wanted for it. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts of how you're going to um, how you're going to do it when you get the uh, materials down. So you're going to identify two models of different types. So so this assignment is in some ways easy and in some way tricky. Up till now in lecture, I say, oh, here's a goal, right? And here's a model. You figure out how it's useful. You figure out how, what the limitations are. It's kind of straightforward to do that. But in this article, you've got to come up with a goal, right? You've got to read this, and you've got to figure out what the goal is. And there might be a half dozen different ways to choose a goal that's relevant to that article. And that's the tricky part for you, because you've got to thread the whole thing together. There can be six ways of doing it that are all correct, but you've got to sort of figure out, OK, well, if I choose that as my goal, the model is this, the limitations are that, and so on. And that's the hard part, I think, with this assignment, is, is sort of backing up and saying, ooh, you know, I've got to read this and figure out a goal here. So you're going to figure out a goal. You're going to do all, you know, this sort of thing. You can read the rest of it. But now, um, OK, so. <clears throat> Then, and so there are some examples here. And you know, curiously, I thought we had some, used to have some good and bad examples. And I don't know that the bad examples still exist. No, they don't. OK. So forget that. Now you go to this thing called a PDF generator. And this looks like some kind of application you're doing online. You put in your name, your EID. Um, <clears throat> and the main thing here is that you know we want to be able to figure out who you are. You're going to have a link to the article if it exists. If you know if you can have one, paste it in there. Uh, source date, etc. Give us the title, um, and hopefully a copy. Here you can put the goal here if it applies to. You can put the goal here. If there's one goal for both models you're going to use, or you can put it down here. You're going to type in model one. So goal, I don't know, um, eliminate bad condoms, um, et cetera. You're going to say what the model is, Erber's test, what it represents. In that case, it would be sex, et cetera. What's the limitation of the model? This is where you got to take into account the goal, the type of model. You got three choices, abstract, sampling, and physical. And the, the only reason we're asking you for this is you got to come up with a second model that's of a different type. So this is kind of a way of forcing you to realize, oh, I've just, you know, I got to choose another one. And then status of the model is something we haven't described, but it's in the context of the article, does the article say this is a load of crap? Does it say it's OK? Does it sort of you know, leave the impression that this model is, is reasonable for your purpose, or is it ambiguous? And this is one that's not necessarily cut and dry, but just basically, if the article says it's a load of crap or there's plenty of evidence against it, you would say the, the model is rejected. Otherwise, it'll be accepted or perhaps ambiguous. You do this with a second model. You get down to the end. You hit this little button that says, generate a PDF. You are not done at this point. Because now you've got this PDF on your computer. And it, you look at it, right? So it, it should be bold letters that what you typed in. You can see if your answers are all there. Then you take this and upload it to Blackboard. So that's the nuts and bolts of how you go about it. Let me give you an, an example now of um, what this might involve. So <clears throat> the setting is Monday morning, the 23rd. 
you're getting up like kind of groggy, you're taking the shuttle to school, um, which I, by the way, I did tell the last class, you know the Cameron Road shuttle is being shut down in the middle of the school year. Does that kind of say something's a, middle, a little miss here, right? Like all these people have, anyway, I guess I don't need to go off on that, but if you happen to have a sign, signed a year lease and now the bus is going away that you rely on. <clears throat> so you're getting on the Cameron Road shuttle and you suddenly realize, oh, didn't I have something to do for class today? Um, and you, then you remember and it's like, okay, the adrenaline hits. You pick up the daily Texan that someone left on the um, shuttle, which probably isn't very realistic because of course, people tend to leave the newspapers on the bus when they're coming back from campus, not going to campus. But nonetheless, that's a flaw in the model I'm using right now. And so now you pick up the daily Texan and you see, oh, here's this article. Um, Students seek great deals at bike auction. Maybe I can use that article. You start reading because you think, okay, well, I'm interested in the, the bike auction. You know, I should have shown up at it, etc. Maybe there's going to be another one at, um, later on in the semester. And you start reading here and, and you see descriptions of things. And so your goal, there could be multiple goals you assign here, right? It, you could think of, okay, how am I going to apply a goal? Well, you could take the, go the goal of the person writing the article. You could take the goal of someone that's described in here, perhaps. Right, this is why it gets confusing. All of these will work. Or you could just say, well, my goal in reading this article is to learn something about the bike auction. So let's start with that goal. <clears throat> right, what, what's it like? So, and you could be more specific than that, right? But that's okay, you can have a very broad goal, you can have a specific one. Um, so model one, while you read down here, well, let's get to paragraph two. The auction takes more than 200 bicycles impounded throughout the year and sells them for prices starting as low as $3. It's like, oh, that's something I wanted to know. Model one, um, as low as $3, okay? That's, what is that a model of? Well. Potentially, how little money I might have to spend to get a bike. <clears throat> what kind of model is it? Well, it's an abstract one, talking about a suggested price. A limitation of the model it does not really say how much I might have to spend. It just says it's the low end. So you might be thinking, well, you know, three dollars, yeah, I can afford that. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm taking the text out there. So you're taking a state, it's a statement out of the article. It's a description. So this is a model of something about the bike auction. So it's, you know, basically it's text. It's a sentence that says something that's useful, potentially useful to me. So for the goal that you have, or? it's, well, um, then you decide whether it's useful for the goal you have. But it's, yes, it's all motivated by, I want to know something about the bike auction. I want to know if it's a way I can get a, a cheap bike. All these are goals that you could throw at this. But this statement here, it's a description of something. It's a model of what the bike auction is like. And if the assignment was done a little differently, we might actually say, well, put in the statement, you know, that you're use, basing this on. So. That's fine. So you fill that out. Um, status. Well, you'd say it's certainly accepted. I mean, it seems to be the reality of the bike show, uh, the bike auction. So that's your first model. Now you go to a second model. It's got to be a different type. 
you go to page two, you start reading about people here. Um, the bike, uh, let's see, Olson was one of the students at the event who was able to win the bidding more for his favorite bike. And then down here, not everyone was able to win at the auction, though. Electrical engineering freshman Justin Kurowitz had his eyes on one of the most expensive bikes at the auction, but blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the bike went into a bidding war, and Kurowitz had to back down at that point, $265. Um, so now you've got another model, model two. Justin of, well, <clears throat> possibly other, you could say he's a model of other buyers, you could say he's a model of me. If I go to the auction, he is a model, his experience could be my experience. He is a real person, so he, be, he is a physical model. And then you've got limitations. of the form of, well, his experience may not be mine, his experience may be unique. Be a typical, you know, all kinds of limitations that you have there. And I guess you fill out the status, again, that would be accepted, right? He's um, certainly a real person that really happened to him, so you're, and then you're done with the assignment. Now, <clears throat> I've taken something that's outside of science, right? There's nothing about health. There's nothing about formal science here. Um, just to give you an idea of how broad this can go. You don't have to pick a scientific article to make this work, although it might be easier. 